In lecture two, I would like to introduce um, or address, say that, address several aspects of geographic data. Um, I mean, not all aspects of geographic data. Uh, instead of that, some aspects of geogra geographic data um, related to statistics, okay? Because this class, after all, is about um, the combination of statistics and uh, geographic data. So firstly, um, the concept of geographic data or say uh, some features, concepts and features of geographic data. So geographic data is data that is spatially referenced, which means that uh, in a geographic data set, we have different geographic entities. These entities could be could be a polygon, could be a point, could be a linear feature, right? But no matter what, each uh, feature here or each geographic entity here has something called location information, associated location information, which means that each entity in a geographic data set um, exists in a context of space. So geographic data or geographic data sets, they're always spatially referenced. Okay. Um, the most commonly, the most the most commonly used uh, method to 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 reference geographic data is what using a pair of coordinates. Okay. For example, latitude and longitude, x or y. Okay, and uh, um, the geographic data is um, is is very difficult to represent and manage in computer. Before, I mean, now it's not that it's not a big problem right now because we have GIS systems, mature uh, software for um, for management of GIS data uh, with computers. But before that, since um, geography data sets they always have they're always spatially referenced you have to find out a way to use computer to address space okay so compared to say a pure mathematical data for example data from um, chemistry from biology um, those data sets you don't have to worry about the visualization of the data um, you can use different plots, figures, uh, charts, tables to visualize data, but at least you don't have to visualize space. But since we're talking about geographic data, um, visualization of space is a problem, okay? Um, that's also the advantage. I mean, the special part about, about geographic data, because for geographic data sets, it's meaningful to visualize. More specifically, it's meaningful to visualize with spatial context, okay? And uh, there are also issues uh, you have to face, okay? You have to deal with when you are dealing with, um, you, you're, you're playing with geographic data sets. For example, boundary problems. I'm going to introduce uh, that a little bit. Uh, scale issues, when scale changes, a lot of things will change. Okay, you have to be aware of that. Okay, and MAUP, modifiable area unit problem. Actually, um, it is related to scale issues. Also, uh, how to do spatial sampling. When you're trying to sample, say, biological data or a chemical data sets, you don't have to consider space. Again, space is the core of geography. But when you're trying to uh, sample some geographic data set from, um, from a, data, a geographic data set, um, you have to consider where to sample them. This where here has literal, um, has its literal meaning. Where, a location, right? Right. So, and uh, you have to be aware about something called spatial autocorrelation. Okay. It means that um, 
some variables, they are uh, correlated to themselves. Okay, okay, because because um, maybe the third party, another factor may affect the spatial distribution of um, geographic entities. Okay, okay, so it's about spatial autocorrelation. I'm going to introduce boundary problems and scale issues in this lecture. Okay, very general introduction. So boundary problems. So study areas are often bounded due to practical constraints or research interests. Okay, this is very common. So in geography, um, when we are trying to address a problem, uh, usually we need to select a study area. Okay, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the relationship between uh, Let's just use uh, that example I used before. The, the, the correlation between population of, uh, of a city and its temperature, for example, it's not necessarily correlated. Um, could be correlated, but just an example. Um, when, you're trying, when you're trying to do this type of research, you at least you need to choose a city or several cities, right? You cannot say, I'm going to just use all cities around the world as my study area is not necessary, right? So you're going to choose study areas. Since you're going to choose study areas, you need to create some um, artificial boundaries for your study area, right? You use that boundary to circle out your study area. However, spatial phenomena under study may not be bounded. Okay, it's just another example. Um, you want to do some, say, climate change research using geographic data. It's very common, right? And you choose United States, this country, as your study area. Of course, since you chose this, uh, you you chose this country. Um, the boundary, the geographic boundary of this country, naturally becomes the boundary of your study area. But can you say that climate change only happens within United States? No, that phenomenon is not bounded by your boundary. It is happening all over the world. Okay, so both the size and shape of boundary can affect the results of geographic analysis. You use a, 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 an artificial boundary, which is the geographic boundary of United States to circle out your study area for climate change. Um, so you can do that. And I think um, um, uh, uh, most area of your within most regions within our study areas will not be affected by this boundary. But how about those regions very close to your study area boundary? Okay, it could be a problem. For example, for example, here, uh, we have several dots here. And uh, uh, this blue, say polygon, represents the boundary of study area. Okay, okay. For this specific, for this specific scenario, okay, let me ask, is there a specific spatial distribution existing in this, uh, in terms of this um, blue dots? You say no, right? There is no obvious clustering or there is no specific spatial pattern or pattern in terms of the spatial distribution of these dots. It seems that they're randomly distributed within this boundary, okay? So this is your conclusion based on this boundary. But if I change the boundary, the polygon still keeps its shape, but it's larger than before. So I'm gonna ask the same question. Is there a spatial pattern for the same group of dots within this area, within this new boundary? This time, you cannot say they're randomly distributed because they are not. 
based on this new boundary, they are clustered in the center of your study area. So your conclusion or say your, 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 your result changed because you changed the boundary of your study area. For scenario two, for this specific scenario, we will say that these dots, these dots, they are clustered in the center of your study area. So you can say this is boundary issue or boundary problem, a type of boundary, a boundary problem. I will give you another example for another type of boundary problem. But here, say, uh, when the boundary cha changed, uh, your result changed. Does your conclusion may change, right? So let's just do, do, do this again. So here we, we have a square area, right? Um, or a rectangle, I'm not sure, but yeah. So uh, still uh, within this boundary, we have dots, but this time blue dot, uh, green dots. Okay, so again, um, is there a spatial pattern? Um, I would say yes and no. Yes, because you can say this part of the, the, the rectangle is empty. This part is also empty. It looks like this um, green dots, no matter what they are, they're trying to avoid this area and that area. Okay, and uh, so there is spatial pattern, I would say that. But on the other hand, I would say no, there is no specific spatial pattern because except for these two empty areas, for the rest um, area, uh, for the rest of space within this boundary, um, all those green dots, they're, they're randomly distributed. I mean, at least for me, okay? So this is boundary one, okay? This blue boundary. Again, if I changed the boundary of the study area, I, now I'm using uh, this polygon uh, addressed by this red boundary. I'm using this polygon as the study area. This time, I'm asking you, is there specific spatial pattern for green dots within this new boundary, this red boundary? This time, it's very obvious, no. No, within this red boundary, I would say all those green dots, they are simply randomly distributed. Maybe there are small clusters, for example, here, right here, and maybe here are uh, some green dots, they are clustered. But yeah, if you are looking at the, 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 the big picture within this um, red polygon, I would say no, there is no spatial, specific spatial pattern for, uh, for, 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 for green dots. It's just randomly distributed. So this is one type of boundary problems. Okay, so how to choose study area? How to choose study area? And the actual uh, selection of study area. In other words, um, the establishment of, uh, of uh, boundaries will affect your results, will affect your results for spatial analysis, okay? And now I will say, um, edge effect, uh, it can be considered, uh, uh, I mean, there is no right or wrong on this. To me, I think edge effect is another type of boundary problems. So edge effect, the nearest neighbor distance for an event near the boundary R, say here, we still, we're still talking about the boundary, okay? Will be biased, okay? Because the event near the boundary is denied the possibility of neighbors outside the boundary. For example, let's just say this rectangle area um, was picked from a larger area. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, <laughs> Let's just say I use this black boundary, this black frame to, 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 to circle out, to pick this rectangle area from a larger area, okay? So we have dots here, black dots here. Okay, let's talk about nearest neighbor. So here I circled out uh, this specific dot here, 
Okay, so who is its nearest neighbor within this boundary, within this rectangular boundary? So you just find uh, another dot that is 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 close to 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 that um, say uh, dot circled out by this red circle. Okay, but um, it has to be the nearest one nearest neighbor right so it's very easy right they start it's they start nearest neighbor within this boundary within the edge within this is four edges okay here comes the problem i told you that this area is just a part of a larger space or a larger area and uh, this boundary here, this edge on the left side, on all four sides, they are, they were arbitrarily decided by me. So is this dot the true nearest neighbor of this dot? Because you're not sure if there is another dot on the right side. Let me just draw one, okay? For example, um, let me say, if I have ink color black, yeah, black is better. So for example, if here is, there, there, there is another dot here. It is actually closer to this dot compared to that dot. So this one, this dot should be the true nearest neighbor of the dot circled out by this um, red circle, but since uh, since there is this edge existing here okay you're not sure you're not sure if the nearest neighbor you just found for this dot is the true nearest neighbor of this dot okay so this is edge effect how to address it i mean like i said you always need to choose or to establish uh, a boundary for your study area. You cannot indefinitely expand your study area. So there are other methods, say methods to, to, to address this issue, edge effect. Uh, I would say there is no perfect method to address this issue, but there is always a better way to deal with it. For example, we use something called creating guard area. Let's just assume again, this time, okay, okay, um, I'm not going to use this whole area. Okay, uh, uh, this whole air, uh, study area as my actual study area. I'm going to use a, another small part of this area decided by this rectangle use that small part as my study area and the central area here and you can say now we have um, blue areas here it's like a donut but rectangle donut okay this blue ring here is considered as guard area okay so this time since i'm going to use only only the area inside this blue ring as my actual study area this time if i'm trying to find out let me use another color here again if i'm trying to find out who is the nearest neighbor of this dot i can consider I can consider other dots within this blue area as possible candidates, okay? So if you do not use guard area, who is the nearest neighbor of this dot? Obviously this one, right? This one. But if you consider all other dots within the blue area, obviously this one should be the nearest neighbor. Okay, so it means that uh, do not be too greedy. Okay, you can choose a study area first and then uh, narrow it down a little bit. 
okay? Only use the central part of the study area as your actual study area, and the rest part of the study area, which is indicated by, by blue, by, by blue area, you can consider this blue area as guard area, okay? When you are doing spatial analysis, all those geographic entities or black dots for this specific uh, scenario, they can also be considered, they can also be taken into account. For example, uh, for, for, for funding uh, nearest neighbors. Okay, so this is one method to address edge effect. Another method is making this study area indefinite. What does it mean? It means that we consider the top side, the top side and the bottom side of this rectangle angle connected, which means that if you are working out, okay, you, if you are working out of the area and uh, ac uh, across the bottom side, you will immediately get back from the top. Okay, so which means that you cannot escape from this space. So it's, it's indefinite. Similarly, if you walk out from the left side, you will immediately go into this area again from the right side. Okay, so this space is called toroidal space. Okay, it's indefinite. So as a result, you actually have this three by three, say spaces, okay? It's just like uh, this space is connected to it itself, okay? But uh, the left side and the right side are stick together, okay? Similarly for the right side, for the top side, for the bottom side which means that if you are a person living in this space, you cannot escape it. It's, it's just um, uh, like earth. No matter which direction you are going, you will never walk out of the surface of the earth, right? Similarly, you can consider this as a sphere. It's a sphere, uh, but um, it, it's a sphere with a repeating space. And the smallest unit of that space is actually this rectangle, angular space, right? Right. We have a uh, non-repeating, uh, or say, uh, non-copies of this space, and they are connected to each other. So, if this is a method you are using to address edge effect, there is actually no edge effect, right? Because um, this space repeats itself. It is also surrounded by itself. So there is never edge, so-called edge anymore, okay? Okay, so next um, aspect of geographic data I want to address here is very hard to deal with. It's called scale, okay? It's called scale. Scale has multiple meanings in geography, okay? The first one is called cartographic scale, okay? The depicted size of a feature on a map relative to its real size in the real world. For example, one to 10,000. It means that um, one unit on your map represents 10,000 units in the real world, or one inch equals one mile. It means that one inch on your map represents the real world distance of one mile. Okay, so this is cartographic scale. It's a part of, uh, of a map. It's a tool to address um, the relationship of distance between uh, the map and the real world. Okay, and the next meaning is called analysis scale the size of the unit at which some problem is analyzed. For example, 30 meter resolution versus one kilometer resolution. Uh, resolution here refers to your, uh, because it is 30 meter resolution, it must be spatial resolution, right? It's a term used in remote sensing. 
Um, it is the smallest unit. Or uh, in, uh, let me put it this way. 30 meter resolution means that one pixel in a remote sensing image represents a 30 meter by 30 meter square in real world. Okay, so it's a type of an analysis scale and a pixel is the smallest unit uh, in a remote sensing image. So examples, okay, for analysis scale. And next, phenomena scale, the size at which human or physical earth structures or processes exist. For example, there is a landscape scale regional scale, national scale, or global scale. Usually when you're doing a research, you have to be sure about your scale first. For example, you want to calculation, um, sorry, you want to calculate um, population density. It's very simple, right? You just need to choose an area and find out the, the size of the area and also find out how many people are living within this area. Right, and you calculate the ratio between the population within the area and the size of the area. That's population. But the problem is, what is the scale you are interested in? Are you interested in calculating the population density of of a small of a small town, of a big city, of a county, of a state, of a of a specific nation? That is called scale. Okay. Okay, that's phenomena scale. And map detail is determined by the scale of the data when we're talking about cartographic, cartographic scale. It means that when you are trying to make a map, the details of this map is decided by the scale of your geographic data set. Okay, if, um, say the data set is very in detail. For example, we have, we have uh, the same coastline here in these two figures. On the left side, it's a better, it's from, this map is from a, a, a detailed geographic data set. Okay, so you can see that the, the details, the detailed shape of this coast can be addressed by this linear feature, right? Let's just assume on the right side, we have a lake on the left side, it's a land. Because the data set is in detail, the map we can make can have a very large map scale or cartographic scale. So it's one to 500. Okay, because the denominator is very small, so the scale is large, right? The, the, the map scale is very large. On, on the right side, we have the same area, same coastline. But here you can see that not much detail can be seen from this map because the scale of the data set used for this map um, was very high. This scale is what? It's phenomena scale. Okay, because, because, for example, if you are um, addressing the coastline at, say, county level, it needs to be in detail just like this. But if you, you're trying to address the same coastline at national level, oh, it's not necessary to pro provide so much detail about this coastline, right? So sometimes if you have a a map with less detail, maybe it's it's because that the, 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 the data quality is not good enough. So you have someone had to make this um, map with less detail, but sometimes it's simply not necessary. But no matter uh, the scale of the data, zooming in on a small scale map does not increase its level of accuracy or detail because um, it is decided by the scale of the data instead of the map. For example, on the right side, um, it's a small scale map compared to the, 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 the map on the left, right? On the right side. No matter how you zoom in, this coastline is, this, is still this coastline. 
you are not going to say more details about this coastline. Even when you zoom in, right? And um, yeah, another example here, right? We have um, blue boundaries and red boundaries, right? Um, obviously, the red one provides more detail. And uh, if you are using the data set uh, for the red boundary here, obviously, you can make a very uh, detailed map. And uh, the accuracy of that map has been decided by the geographic data set. Okay, similarly for the for the blue one. Okay, so this is a cartographic scale. Okay, uh, next let's talk about spatial resolution. Spatial resolution. Um, spatial resolution. It is a type of analysis scale. Analysis scale, right? So here we have. Um, three images for the same area, um, Venice in Italy, urban area, right? Uh, we have three images here, but they are from three sensors. The left one is from ETM Plus, which is the sensor for Landsat family. And we also have ALI, and uh, the, the, right, the, the one on the right is from a sensor called Hyperion. These three images, they are all uh, at 30 meter spatial resolution. So you can say, we can clearly say there are pixels in all the three images. Each pixel has a specific color, okay? Um, okay, so these three images, they are at 30 meter spatial resolution, okay? Another one, Aster, this image is for the same area, but at 15 meter spatial resolution. If you compare this image to the rest three of them, rest three images, you can find more details in this aster image because each pixel in this image only represents a 15 meter by 15 meter area in the real world. But for all three image, images, here at the bottom of this slide, each pixel represents a 30 meter by 30 meter area in the real world. So less detail compared to the 15 meter spatial resolution. Let's just make it better. Eight meter. This time you can, if you have some very basic fundamental uh, visual interpretation experience of remotely sensed data, you can tell different land types here. At the bottom, we have ocean, right? Water body. This is urbanized area, right? And here, this is a harbor, okay? And uh, um, this is at eight meter spatial resolution. If I'm asking you, uh, one second, let me erase. If I'm asking you, for different land cover types and gave you these three images at 30 meter, it's very difficult for you, for, for, for anybody to tell which pixel is what, okay? And uh, when the spatial resolution increases, it gets easier and easier to tell different land cover types. So your analysis will become, hmm, easier, okay, your analysis um, of land cover types. And if we make this even better, Iconos, four meter spatial resolution, you can even tell different canals, right? Right, canals, different street blocks, and even roofs of different buildings, they can all be recognized in this image with four meter Spatial resolution. And you can see shapes, right? We can see shapes. So this is a business area, a harbor, or something like that. And uh, this dark area is for urban area. Okay, so this is an example of analysis scale. And uh, there are also scale effects, okay, on spatial heterogeneity or homogeneity. What does it mean? So let's just say 
this is a specific area we're interested in, okay? And this is a pixel used to address this area. Okay, now let's say, I'm not going to use one pixel to address this area. I'm going to use one, two, three, four, five. Five by five pixels to address this area, which means we have 25 pixels to address this area. Okay, we can also combine these 25 pixels to form one single pixel. What's the difference? What's the, what's the difference? So if one pixel is just one pixel, we have this figure here, a lot of details, right? And each pixel is smaller, okay? When you combine five by five pixels, 25 pixels, and combine them to form a new one single pixel, you get this map, okay? Less details compared to one by one, but it's okay. But if you do this continuously, 10 by 10, 30 by 30, 40 by 40, until 100 by 100, you will see that there is less and less detail can be found in your image. So this is one by one. One pixel is just one pixel. A lot of details here. We can say linear features, polygons, and here is a river, right? And also different colors there for different land cover types. Although I'm not sure what they are because I don't have the legend here, but details, they're there. So we can see very high heterogeneity, spatial heterogeneity here. Uh, it means that um, there are a lot of different things within this space. But when we combine more and more pixels together to form, um, uh, to form um, less and less pixels in the image, we have less and less details in this process from one by one to five by five to 40 by 40 to 100 by 100. When we're talking about this image of 100 pixel by 100 pixel, it means that 100, uh, 100 by 100, what's that? Uh, 10,000, right? 10,000 pixels in this original image is just one pixel in this 100 by 100 image, okay? So there is no heterogeneity here. There is homogeneity, spatial homogeneity in this, la in this last figure. There are only several colors. You cannot, you cannot tell where the river is, okay? You cannot tell where the roads are. All those linear features, they are roads. And we have a very huge river, okay? Flowing, uh, flowing across, goes across this image. This spatial heterogeneity disappeared Okay, when you change the scale by combining pixels, okay? Okay, so this is called scale effect. Okay, um, and uh, for the last part of this video, not this lecture, I want to um, address the different dimensions of geographic data, okay? So uh, we have primary data and the secondary data depends on different data sources. Okay, prim primary data is collected directly from original source. Okay, so if you are working in the field, you use some e equipment or instrument to, to do field measurement, the data you collected is what? Primary data or from, from uh, original source is the instrument in your hands. Okay, secondary data acquired from existing source. Okay, for example, um, uh, say you get the primary data, right? And you made some change to the primary data. For example, eliminate some, eliminated some noise um, and did some sampling and published the, 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 the data um, after your manipulation to a website, on a website. And uh, 
provide the data. I mean, you can uh, to the public, okay? And the public can download from that uh, website. And uh, the data people get from that website is called secondary data, okay? Okay. And the spatial component, uh, we have spatially explicit data, okay, or spatially implicit data. For spatial explicit data, locations are of interest, which means locations matter, okay, in your research. Uh, if locations are not analyzed, it's called spatially implicit data, okay. Sometimes um, uh, spatial, uh, sp uh, uh, the type of data in terms of spatially explicit or implicit is decided by the uh, by the nature of the data itself. If you have a data set and uh, there is simply no information about locations, then it's spatially implicit, right? But there is also probability that you have a data set with um, accurate and complete um, uh, location information, but in your research, you just don't want to use them. It's not necessary to use them. Um, you can also consider it as spatially implicit data, although, although locations are listed there in the data set, but locations are not of your interest. So you can consider it as a spatially implicit data set, okay? And also uh, data aggregation, uh, we have individual level data representing individual element or unit or spatially aggregated data a summary or spatial aggregation of individual units. For example, uh, this concept is relative, okay? You can consider the population of a city as individual level data. Um, in this scenario, we consider each city as an individual. Right, and uh, spatially aggregated data can be a uh, city population of a state, right? There could be multiple, of course, there are multiple cities within a state. And if you consider each city as an individual, then when you're talking about uh, city population within the state, this data set is uh, spatially aggregated data because your data set includes all cities from different um, parts of the state, right? You can all, uh, so uh, that's the reason why I, uh, I mentioned that um, this definition here, individual or aggregated, they are relative. You can consider a specific person as individual and the whole class as the aggregation of individuals. You can also consider a city is pretty big, right, as an individual. And if that is the case, maybe you should consider uh, the whole state or even the whole country as an aggregation of individuals, okay, okay. And we also have um, qualitative uh, data or quantitative data. Qualitative data assigned to one of two or more categories, which means that um, we use different numbers for to represent categories, okay? Uh, if we are talking about uh, quantitative data assigned to numerical values, which means that specific values, they have meanings. For example, uh, qualitative data, mm, let's say level of education. If I assign one to high school diploma, two to bachelor degree, three to master degree, four to PhD degree, then um, one, two, three, four, they are simply names or uh, they are used to address different categories. You cannot say one plus two equals three. What does it mean in this specific scenario? High school diploma plus bachelor equals master. It doesn't make sense, right? So that's qualitative data. 
Sometimes qualitative data sets don't even have numbers in it, just names and labels, maybe. On the other hand, quantitative data is different. Numerical values, they are, I cannot say they are meaningful because one, two, three, four for different degrees, they're also meaningful, right? But uh, numerical values here, they can be manipulated. For example, 22 Celsius degree and 32 Celsius degree, what's the difference between them? 32 minus th uh, 22 equals what? 10 Celsius degree. That 10 Celsius degree is the difference between these two readings, right? So it's meaningful, right? Right, it's meaningful. So that's quantitative data. And we also have discrete or continuous data, okay, when we describe geographic data sets. Discrete data um, resulted from um, counting or tabulating limited to discrete values, for example, a data set with only integers. Okay, and usually uh, when we're talking about remote sensing data, we consider remote sensing data sets as discrete data because um, when we're talking about remote sensing data sets, it's usually data sets of uh, imagery and each Im image can be considered as a combination or a collection of pixels and each pixel is discrete, okay? Okay, and uh, we also have continuous data resulted from measurement include um, an infinite number of possible values along some interval, uh, for example, um, temperature in Celsius degree. Okay, okay. Um, how many possible readings between 22 Celsius degree and 23 Celsius degree? How many? How many possible readings are there uh, between these two readings? Infinite number of possible readings, right? So continuous data. Okay, um, I will just stop here for this video. And uh, from next video, I'm going to start with levels of measurement. Okay, thank you.